Um, and so before we kick into things, I thought I'd give a quick intro to myself. And when I was thinking about this um, presentation, I was reflecting on two years ago, my first conference talk was in Serverless Days Paris. I remember being extremely nervous, and those nerves don't quite go away, actually. Um, but yeah, that's a photo of the first one. And I just wanted to say like, thank you to Serverless Days, because I think it's a really awesome conference. It's not for profit. And I think there's just a huge amount of passion that goes into a conference like this. Um, so yeah, it's awesome. And that is the final time you'll get to see the QR code before I announce the winner. So catch it now if you haven't. Um, so I'm an engineer at the Lego Group. And I work with a lot of, well, a lot of different things. But from data privacy of our customers to A-B testing with um, other squads. Um, and the LEGO group, it's not completely serverless, um, but the parts that I work with pretty much are. And there's so much to learn from the different squads. It's not just, there's, well, I don't know how many squads there are now, but there's so many, and they're all doing different things, so it's a great place to learn. So without further ado, let's go into the serverless behind lego.com. So just to kind of tell the story of how lego.com became serverless, so as you can imagine, I mean, the website's been around for ages, so it wasn't always serverless. And 2017 Black Friday was a trigger for change. And what happened on that Black Friday is essentially we had loads of customers come to the website, and then one thing went wrong in the system. None of it was serverless. It didn't scale, and everything went down. And I can imagine, I mean, I wasn't there. Right? I've only been working at the Lego Group for a year and a half, but I can imagine how stressful that was. I think that that's when they started to think, okay, we need to do something about this so that we don't encounter these problems in future. So they embarked on a serverless journey, and it still is a journey. Um, many of it is not serverless, um, but it's just trying to get better every day, really. But the parts that we'll speak about are totally serverless, because that's why we're all here. Um, and so the main reasons we did this was to have graceful failure. So now a lot of the systems are all decoupled from each other. And when one thing does unfortunately fail, the whole system doesn't necessarily go down, like on that fateful uh, Black Friday. And of course, we want it to scale well to the number of customers who are going to come on Black Friday or Christmas or any time like that. And another part that wasn't detrimental at the time, but they were releasing maybe like once a week, and it was a real effort to release um, code. So we wanted to make sure that we could start to release more quickly. And the way that this started to happen was to have different squads um, all kind of decoupled from each other, all communicating through events. So for example, where do I sit? I sit in the analytics team. But we have teams for all different parts of the website. And they can all have their own uh, cloud accounts, all have their different CI, CD pipelines. And that means that releasing became a lot uh, more quick. And the way that the cloud accounts are organized is we are using AWS organizations to have a root account, which defines a load of SCPs that um, the cloud accounts beneath have to abide by. But then there's a lot of autonomy that the squads have in the teams to be able to use the technology that they need for their systems. And in that sense, developer experience became a lot better. Um, I mean, people could choose their own languages because we had different repos. Um, and it also made hiring easier as well, because when we got someone with a certain skill set, you knew which team they would fit in with uh, best. So the high-level architecture that we're at now, and this is extremely high level. Um, if we have a user, they come in through a CDN, and then they're load balanced, and the front end is hosted on Fargate. Um, and that's the front end hosting, so we'll leave that there. But the back end is all pretty much API gateway and serverless services, um, and often communicating with other third party services. Um, and that's just a decision that we have to make whether we kind of build internally or, or buy. Um, just whatever works for us, really. So to go on a serverless customer journey, I tried to make it fun by integrating the front end, just so there's something a bit more visual. So we come onto the website, and the first thing that we're greeted with is the dreaded consent modal. And 
essentially, this defines what we can and can't do with customer data, um, which is a big part of my job. And what happens when you click just necessary or accept all is a API call co goes off and we go into our, like, our own service, the API gateway. And the nice thing about it is it, it's extremely simple. So we own the API gateway and the Lambda, and then that calls an internal consent service, which is essentially just DynamoDB. There's a bit more to it than that, but many teams are integrating with the consent service, which is why we don't just own the database. So we're just integrating with it as one of the teams on lego.com. But behind the scenes, that's pretty much what's going on. And DynamoDB like, handles it really well. Um, as I'm sure we all know, it's a great service. And then how do we figure out which products to recommend to the users? Sorry, <laughs> forgot to bring my water up. Um, so when you come onto the website, you may be, if you're interested in Star Wars, then you might be recommended Star Wars product, products. And obviously like, that all seems a bit magic, but it's quite basic the way that it actually works. Um, of course, we have to have consent from that cookie modal to be able to provide you with those recommendations. If you haven't consented, then you'll just get provided products not based on your data. And so if you as a customer go to click on Marvel and you're kind of clicking around on things, then we'll be sending events to the back end with various different pieces of information. So probably the product page that you did click on and all of this data goes through our event feeder, which essentially looks like this. And it's an API gateway that goes into a Kinesis data fire hose. And Kinesis data fire hose is pretty awesome because, I mean, we just don't have to touch it at all. Like it is, it just handles the scale really well on any day. And then we put all those events into an S3 bucket, which on the object creation triggers a Lambda function, which based on a set of SSM uh, rules will then fire off the different events to different consumers that require the data. We definitely have more than uh, three consumers now, but there, there are quite a lot of consumers um, that take from this central event feeder. So to dive into that a little bit more, um, obviously I've explained the Kinesis Firehose, now, the interesting part to kind of make it more efficient is rather than creating a file every time an event comes in, which would be extremely costly, and then subsequently triggering a Lambda off of that, we batch all of the events. Um, and Kinesis, integrated with S3, handles that really nicely. You just have to set the buffer size and buffer interval. Um, and then whichever condition is met first, then it will create a file and then trigger the uh, Lambda, which is then going to send on those batched of events to the various consumers. So at that point, it's been sent to the recommendations engine, which is not part of my team. They do some like fun algorithms to figure out um, what to return to the user. Um, but essentially, we're just sending all those events to their API, and then they figure, figure that out. And so I thought I'd do a quick demo to kind of show, um, and hopefully it's going to work. That's what I was stressing out at the beginning, because the mirroring isn't working perfectly. Uh, but we'll see how it goes. So hmm. can anyone tell me whether that's OK or not? It's all right. OK, great. <laughs> it's a bit um, large on my screen, but OK. So. I just put together, this isn't the lego.com code base because we didn't need to have all the fluff around it. I just kind of wanted to show how simple it is to get something like this working. And I remember when I put this together, which was a while ago because I realized it was using uh, Node 14 at the time and then I cheekily changed that to 18 to not look so bad. Uh, <laughs> but basically in here, um, and yes, yeah, still using serverless framework, um, but it's fine for this sort of simple... Um, demo, but at the moment, myself and my team are actually working towards using CDK for Terraform, which is really awesome. So I think I need to convert all of this, um, but it's good for now. So there is some Lambda functions, um, which I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with. And then the event that triggers this triage is um, an S3 object creation. 
and I've made sure that it only gets um, triggered if the file comes under the prefix ecom events. And then I've, I mean, I've put in some roles there, but I don't think we need to go through those, but we have a Kinesis Firehose, and you can see that I've set this interval in seconds and the size in megabytes. My main reason for showing you the code is to kind of just show how, how simple the configuration is just to do this. And then in the Lambda functions, I put some consumers. Um, you'll see in a minute why I called them energy and healthcare, because that's nothing to do with Lego. Um, but I've just console logged it out, because I just want to prove at the end that they did get fired. And then we have the triager, which I've just made sure um, sends the various um, events to the various consumers. So that will all make sense in the console. Where, hmm, the, <laughs> I can't read that. I hope that you guys can. Um, so, in Kinesis, they have this really nice feature where you can just um, start sending demo data. And I'm going to waffle on now for a minute because we obviously have this interval size of a minute um, before we see anything in the S3 bucket. So, maybe interesting things to point out are that the destination is uh, Amazon S3. And then in S3, I wanted to show that. Um, you, you can see that this is then um, sending off event no notifications in the configuration. And then the other part to point out that I believe is in management is that I've set a lifecycle rule on the S3 bucket to delete things after two days um, because we're, we're not trying to house the data. This is just purely an event stream and then left it in there for two days just in case we need to replay anything or something like that. So hopefully now I can go into the file and we'll see, so we're in 2023, we're in September, we're on the 21st. Uh, it's not quite through yet, that was me testing this morning. Um, maybe it's not been a minute. Here we go. So, we're on a different time zone here, but you can see now we've got this uh, batched event, and if I open that, you can see that the events have come through. Um, and so I based the different rules on these sectors, which is just the thing that Kinesis is sending through with retail, finance. So if I go into CloudWatch and I logged out those events, then we can have a look and see that those were triggered at 11.44, and they're logged out. So yeah, the main, the main reason for that demo is just to kind of show the simplicity of it, and it works. It works at like really high scale, which is very cool. So if we go back to the presentation. So the result is that you see recommended products um, on the website when you come to it. And so to continue the user journey, we now want to check out. And so we add a product to the bag. We go through the checkout process. And then we get through to payments. And so when you've actually click to pay, then you're going to have this dot, dot, dot page where there's some things going on in the background, and then you'll find out if your payment was successful or not, and you'll get an order confirmation. Um, but in the background, a lot of this is now asynchronous. Um, and the reason for this is that, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Actually, I'll start here. So <laughs> the, um, the payments platform is a platform that, at the bottom, as you can see, there's many different business units in Lego that uh, tie into the payments platform. So whether that's through events or API calls, it's all feeding through there. And then behind the scenes, we've got third-party payment pr uh, providers. Um, as you can imagine, you can pay with Google Pay or Apple or whatever. Um, and at the heart of the payments platform is EventBridge. And what I was about to say is that this all came about a few years ago when one of the issues that we were having with uh, the payments process is you'd have a payment request, and this is all happening while you're on that dot, dot, dot page. Payment request goes to the payment service. You'd get a synchronous response from the payments provider to say, yeah, okay, we're processing it. And then you'd then get an asynchronous response from the payments provider to say whether it failed or passed. And on the, on the front end, we'd have like a service um, on the back end of the front end, which connects into the payment service. That would be polling for a status, so you would look in your network um, in your network tab, and you would see that it was polling for a status update, which obviously is really inefficient and um, just unnecessary stress on the payment service. 
and then customers would be waiting longer than necessary as well. So we changed all that to push the status update um, to rectify it, which made it all event-driven somewhat. And the way that we did this is we'd have the, the payment service, which the payments provider could push an event onto the event bridge. And then, and it sounds like a lot of event bridge, because we're all in these decoupled services that have their own event bridges, then we could push updates from the payments event bridge to the client event bridge, which is on the order service of lego.com. And I don't sit in this squad, so I don't know too much about it, but I believe that the way that they make all of the events standardized and all work together and things don't break when people change things is they use async API and cloud events, which is, I think, quite an interesting thing to look into when you're dealing with event-driven architectures and seems to be the standard maybe now. And then another interesting part of EventBridge uh, that we use is API destinations. So when we have a client that use, doesn't use EventBridge um, and they have an, an API, then we can use API destinations to go from event to um, API. And the way that this works is we'll have target rules and API destinations allows you to filter and transform. So you'll take an event and then you can do a transformation with it and then hit an API endpoint. So that means that, for example, our customer services API who are taking orders over the phone, they, they can do all that through their system as well, um, which is a really nice feature of EventBridge. So I do have a quick demo of this as well. Um, hopefully the last one went okay in terms of seeing things. Um, so, it's, it's huge on my screen. Um, hopefully that's okay. So, again, very similar setup, just in serverless framework. Um, I created a REST endpoint, and that is simply just a Lambda um, console logging something out just to prove that it happened. Uh, just set it up with um, an API endpoint just to have that REST endpoint to show API destinations. And then the interesting part is in the payment service where I've, create, I've set up an event bus and then we have to uh, create the authentication with the API key to connect to the um, API endpoint. And then I just put in the configuration of the HTTP endpoint and then the event bridge rule. Um, so we have to make sure, or in this situation, that the domain is Lego payments in order for it to be triggered. And then there's a role attached to that, of course. So just to show that in the console, if I just grab an event, which I thought that I had in the readme. Yeah, I have one here. Um, So if we go to event buses, and then I've created this custom event bus as we saw in the YAML file, and then we can send the event. Um, so if we call this Cardiff 2023, say Cardiff, and then an event. And so you can see I've put the domain as Lego payments so that we actually do trigger um, the API downstream. And let's just change this so that, because I tested this this morning, so Cardiff send. And before we go and check that, I'll just show that we have the, in here you can see that the API destination is set up with the HTTP endpoint. And then in CloudWatch, We can go to the REST endpoint and see that it's been triggered at 10, um, 11.50. And because I logged the event out that came through just to show, you can see that the user agent says API destinations and the event has come through. So that's a very basic demo of how API destinations works um, for anyone who hasn't used it before. And so back to here, um, we play from the current slide. And so then the Lego's on its way. Hopefully the payment has all gone through properly and, um, and you'll be getting your Lego soon. Um, and that's everything. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining. It's really nice to be able to speak here. Um, and yeah, have a good rest of the day.